this feels like one of those topics where I've taught this before, and I feel like I've taught this before, haven't I? Maybe it's a deja vu. Who knows? Anyways, let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at enteric fever, also referred to as typhoid fever. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab a piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So here's our warm-up station, which is a Noski station. A 10-year-old female presents to the hospital complaining of a history of abdominal pain and constipation. On physical examination, the girl has a temperature of 39.8 degrees Celsius and you note her skin to have certain lesions depicted below. What is the diagnosis? What are the lesions shown in the image? What is the main causative agent? List four investigations you would undertake to confirm your diagnosis. What is the drug of choice in management of this patient? So here is the picture. You may pause the video right now. Write down your answers. I will give you the answer at the end of the lecture. So here's our history perspective, which may become very important in one exam, maybe in future when you're actually studying postgraduate. So our history perspective is based on Mary Mallon, who is also referred to as Typhoid Mary. This is her. So this was an Irish-born cook that was based in the United States that was believed to actually have infected 53 people with typhoid fever, of which three were confirmed to have died from typhoid fever, and she was actually the first person in the U.S. to be identified as an asymptomatic carrier of the disease. So, way back, this disease was initially referred to as typhoid fever because it was very similar to typhus. Remember, anything that ends in O-I-D in science means like. Deltoid, it's like a delta sign, like a triangle. Typhoid, it's like typhus. So it was later on renamed to enteric fever, which is pretty much an acute systemic illness that's going to be characterized by fever, headache, and abdominal discomfort caused by Salmonella enterica variant typhi, and less commonly Salmonella paratyphi A, B, O, C. Remember that Salmonella typhi is, man is the only known host, and if you look at the disease, the hallmark of the disease is that fever and you have abdominal pains. But these features are actually even variable, which leads to enteric fever being a misnomer. The organism actually enters into the body via the GIT and gains access into the bloodstream via the lymphatics. I'll talk about the life cycle very shortly. And remember that enteric fever is a common cause of fever lasting more than seven days in clinical practice. What is the structure of Salmonella? It's part of a family that's known as Enterobacteriaceae. So it's going to be flagellated. It's encapsulated. It's a facultative, anaerobic, non-sporing, non-spore-forming, gram-negative bacilli. Like all the other organisms in the family, it's going to be possessing certain characteristic antigens. And I want you to keep this in mind because we can check for these antigens using specific tests to make a diagnosis of enteric fever. And some of these antigens are going to be essential in the pathogenesis of the condition. So you have a somatic antigen, an O antigen, a flagella antigen or an H antigen, and a capsular antigen. Now what's the pathophysiology or the pathogenesis of the condition? So generally the transmission is going to be fecal oral. So yes, for you to have had typhoid fever, you may have ingested poop at one time. In your life. So the infective dose of typhoid or even paratyphoid bacillus varies. It's about 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 6 organisms. And the incubation period is roughly about 3 to 21 days. Remember that this is a period by which you get the infection to when the symptoms actually begin to manifest. So after you actually ingest the organism, it actually survives the gastric barrier, the acid in the in the stomach and reaches the intestines. So conditions that actually reduce the amount of acid that you have, like antacids, histamine type 2 blockers, proton pump inhibitors, these are all going to be reducing the infective dose and making you more susceptible to getting typhoid fever. 
So remember that gastric acid is actually protective. So anything that will lower the gastric acid secretion, immunocompromised. So if someone just ingests a large inoculum, then they are going to be getting the disease. Remember that infection with salmonella is going to be characterized by attachment of the bacteria by the fimbriae or the pili to the cells of the intestinal lumen. Remember that once these have now been attached to that area, they are going to be specifically infecting the M cells, the macrophages of the PS patches. These are very, very prominent in the terminal part of the ileum. Once now the bacteria have been internalized by what is known as a receptor-mediated endocytosis and they're transported in the phagosome. Remember that they have that capsule which prevents phagocytosis. The capsular antigen or the presence of their capsule prevents phagocytosis. So then they'll be transported in these phagosomes to the lamina propria where they're going to be released. And once they're now within the lamina propria, then they're going to be inducing an influx of macrophages, the typhoidal strains and neutrophils the non-typhoidal strains. And remember that the capsular antigen is quite important at preventing the antibody-mediated opsonization and complement-mediated lysis. So the salmonella typhi organisms are going to be inducing cytokines to be released, and then eventually some of them will be ingested by these inflammatory cells, but they're not going to be able to digest it effectively by phagocytosis. So once now within these inflammatory cells, they're going to be carried and spread through the reticular endothelial system to the regional lymph nodes, especially the mesenteric lymph nodes. Then after about 7 to 14 days, there's going to be bacteremia, and then they are going to spread to the phagocytes of the liver, the gallbladder, the spleen, the bone marrow, and the pierced patches of the ileum. So this actually marks the onset of the clinical manifestations in enteric fever. So the infection actually leads to both local and systemic immune response, which, however, inadequate to prevent relapse or reinfection. Then the usual site of carriage are going to be the gallbladder, especially those that have gallstones are more likely to become chronic carriers. In individuals where there is, they're living in an area that is endemic for urinary schistosomiasis, they are also going to be urinary bladder carriers. And remember that once now the bacterium is found in now the liver or the gallbladder, it can be excreted into the bile and then later on into the feces, completing the transmission cycle. What are some of the clinical features? There is a prodrome of non-specific features that often precede the fever. So a dull headache, dizziness, cough, sore throat, chills, anorexia, nausea, weakness, malaise, muscle pains. Tell me a condition where you don't see these non-specific things. So it actually mimics quite many conditions. Malaria can actually even present in a similar way. And remember that the gastrointestinal system symptoms are going to be quite variable. Generally, the onset of the illness is going to be gradual, insidious, and nonspecific. But there is going to be what is known as a persistent step ladder fever. So this is going to be lasting more than one week and is going to be attributed to the endotoxins. They may have headache, asthenia, where someone is very weak to even have the strength to walk. They may have insomnia, anorexia, epistasis, which is nose bleeding, abdominal pains. Remember that the fever initially starts off as a low grade then has this stepwise increase and can actually peak as high as 39.4 to 40 degrees Celsius by the end of the first week. And remember that the hallmark of viral infections is that the peak is usually at the onset of the fever. It's not happening during the course. When the fever, when the onset of the disease happens, that's where you have the highest fever being recorded. The opposite is different, rather. The opposite is true. I don't know what's happening to my grammar there. The opposite is true with typhoid fever. So remember that patients can present with either diarrhea or constipation. Constipation is often due to hypertrophy of the PS patches. And diarrhea is much more common in patients that have AIDS in children that are less than the age of one. And of course, diarrhea occurs early, but usually disappears by the time the fever and the bacteremia occur. So after the first week of bacteremia, they're going to be having the sustained high fevers delirium, they may have a tender abdomen, they may have an enlarged spleen. Then they, they may also have rose spots. These are rose-colored macules on the abdomen that may be seen, but they rarely occur. But if you see them, then it's most likely that this child has typhoid fever. I will show you what they look like in the subsequent slide. Then they may have leukopenia, take note of this, and anemia. And in the physical findings, they may have a coated tongue, rose spots, which are rarely seen, abdominal tenderness, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly. Then in the third week or within three weeks, if they do not receive treatment, they have severe complications. Just think of all the itis you can actually think about. 
meningitis, encephalitis, they may have a coma, lobe pneumonia, myocarditis, splenic abscess, hepatitis, cholecystitis, osteomyelitis, disseminated intravascular coagulation, intestinal perforation, acute abdomen, peritonitis, intestinal hemorrhage, which is obviously due to the necrotic payas patches and necrosis of these then penetrating through the wall of a vessel. And it's usually mild though, but it can be life-threatening. Remember that the term severe or complicated enteric fever is going to be used for patients that present with the following things. If they have neurological symptoms like delirium, coma, amputation, or even stupor, or if they have shock, then you would refer to this as severe or complicated enteric fever. Then the fourth week of the illness, they are characterized by gradual improvement. So 30% of those that are actually infected will die. 10% of those that are untreated will relapse. Then after clinical recovery, about 5 to 10% of the patients will continue to excrete the pathogen for several months. So you call these as covalent carriers. 1 to 4% may actually carry the organisms for one year or more than one year. You call this as chronic carriage, and carriage can happen in the gallbladder and urinary bladder, especially in areas where people have gallstones and in areas that are endemic for urinary schistosomiasis. This is what the rose spots look like. So they're just erythematous macules. So when you see this with features, non-specific features, you should suspect that this child may have typhoid fever. Now, what's the diagnosis? The definitive diagnosis is obviously seeing is believing. So culture the salmonella typhi or paratyphi from the patient. So blood cultures are positive in most cases in the first two weeks. Bone marrow cultures are actually much more sensitive and actually are the gold standard, but usually it's quite difficult to obtain them. So usually we may actually just go with the blood cultures. And they're rarely required, especially that we start patients on antibiotics very soon. So even if you do the culture, they may come out as a negative. You may get cultures from the intestinal secretions and the urine as well. Generally, there is a mnemonic that we use, which is known as BUS, B-U-S, blood or bone marrow in the first week, urine cultures in the second week, stool cultures in the third week. Then the culture media is going to be bowel broth media. You collect 10 mils in adults, 5 mils in children, and a blood to media ratio of 1 to 5 should be maintained. So in a full blood count, you may see leukopenia, very important, absolute eosinopenia, and neutrophilic predominance. It's a common but rather nonspecific. Anemia and thrombocytopenia can be seen in the advanced stages. C-reactive protein is very high, and this is very important to distinguish it from other viral fevers like dengue, where there's not so much of a high increase in the C-reactive protein. And there may be a mild elevation in the transam transaminases of the liver, that's two to three times, and AST is going to be raised more than ALT. You may sometimes order for some serological wide or antigen test, but these are of very little practical value because number one, they're not so sensitive, they're not so specific, and they're easily misinterpreted. So these are going to be detecting antibodies, IgM and IgG, against the H, the flagella antigen, or the O, the somatic antigen, which the, the H antigen is common in uh, type, someone with typhi and paratyphi A and B, and they are also common in um, the O antigen is common in these organisms as well. Remember that the anti O titers are both IgG and IgM that rise and decline early, while as those that are against the H antigen are primarily the IgG and they rise and they decline later on in the disease. So, conventionally, if you have a fourfold rise in the anti body titers in two samples, this is considered as a positive result. And a single titer at least 1 to 160 for both O and H can also be considered as a positive result. Remember the bus, blood in the first week, urine in the second week, stool cultures in the third week. What's our differential diagnosis? It may be malaria, it may be a urinary tract infection, it may be a lower respiratory tract infection, it may even be dengue fever in endemic areas. How do we manage this person? So we generally want to isolate the patient. So if the child has persistent vomiting, inability to take oral fluids, they, are sev they have severe uh, diarrhea or abdominal distension, generally this, this is a candidate for intravenous antibiotic therapy. It's a candidate for intravenous fluids, and this child is a candidate for hospital admission. So we want to keep a close surveillance. We want to hydrate them. We want to treat the fever.
So resistance actually has been seen with the first line drugs. And previously we used to give chloramphenicol 50 milligrams per kg per day, but now there is some resistance to this. Trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, ampicillin, there is some resistance. And of course, resistance to nalidixic acid is also going to be a marker to suggest resistance or failure to fluoroquinolones because these were initially our, or are actually currently our first line treatment. So the fluoroquinolones are considered as drug of choice in areas where the quinolone resistance is not frequent, then other drugs of choice could include the third generation cephalosporins, which is ceftriaxone and sufixin. The oral route is actually preferred and much more effective than the parenteral route. So if the patient can take orally, give them orally. So if they have an uncomplicated enteric fever, we start them on ciprofloxacillin orally for five to seven days. If it's children, 30 milligrams per kg per day in two divided doses. So usually not recommended in children under the age of 15. However, the life-threatening risks of the typhoid fever greatly outweigh the adverse effects of the drug. Alternatives include suffixum orally for seven days in children under 15. So for those that are over six months, 15 to 20 milligrams per kg per day in two divided doses. For the adults, one gram per day in two divided doses. Azithromycin, 10 to 20 milligrams per kg per day. And in patients that have severe typhoid fever, that's a confusional state uh, where they're hallucinating these altered level of consciousness or so they have complications. Generally, you want to give them a third generation cephalosporin, so your intravenous ceftriaxone and cefotaxim can be used at a dose of 100 milligrams per kg per day. Remember that parenteral treatment should be continued until the, the fever has been done away with and then oral antibiotic treatment can be given when they improve and the complications resolve. So thereafter you can give oral cefixim that can be given to complete the total duration of 14 days. Other drugs that can be used when you switch the therapy, azithromycin, cotrimoxazole, amoxicillin, but of course there has been some resistance to some of these drugs. In patients with penicillin or cephalosporin allergy, astriodum can actually be used, chloramphenicol in higher doses, Cotrimoxazole can also be used as a second line. Do not forget to give dexamethasone IV loading dose of 3 mg per kg and then 1 mg per kg every 6 hours for 2 days. Second line for drug resistant cases, imipenem can actually be used. So if the couches are positive and show quinolone sensitivity, change them to ciprofloxacillin 20 mg per kg per day. Because remember that quinolones are associated with a faster defervescence and a lower relapse rate, they can actually even eradicate the salmonella even in the presence of gallstones. Then if the culture is positive and shows the quinolone resistance as well as resistance to ampicillin, chloramphenicol and cotrimoxazole, we switch them to ceftriaxone. If the culture is negative and defervescence has not occurred by day seven, then we should make a thorough search for alternative causes of the fever and ceftriaxone should be continued. There is no role actually for changing the antimicrobial agent to, or adding another drug in this case because ceftriaxone resistance is, hasn't yet been significantly noted. Now for the relapses, these are commonly seen with beta-lactams, the ceftriaxone, suffixum, especially if there's a shorter duration of therapy that is used. And remember that relapse can satisfactorily be treated with the same drug as what we used in the primary treatment, but at an appropriate dose and at an appropriate duration. And if we isolate uh, the quinolone sensitivity and quinolones uh, were used for the primary treatment, then they should be used to treat the relapse. Then with the carriers, they, this is actually quite uncommon in children, and we can test for chronic carriage three months after the episode of each enteric fever. It's not recommended though, but if it is demonstrated, give them amoxicillin 100 milligrams per kg per day with probenicid, 30 milligrams per kg per day, or cotrimoxis, or 10 milligrams per kg per day for 6 to 12 weeks. If the strain is nalidixic acid sensitive, give them quinolones for 28 days. This is actually a better option. In the prevention of the condition, disinfection of the feces with 2% chlorine is essential. Good and proper hygiene, proper waste disposal, individual hygiene, hand washing, collective hygiene, safe water supply, and sanitation. These are the key things to most fecal oral conditions. Then there is a possibility of vaccination that must be considered. It can be useful in some situations, for example, high risk age groups, hyper endemic zones, but its effectiveness is actually controversial because with both types of vaccines, the injectable inactivated vaccine and the oral live attenuated vaccines, they both do just give you partial protection.
Now, coming back to our warm-up OSCE station, a 10-year-old girl presents to the hospital complaining of a history of abdominal pain and constipation. On physical examination, the girl has a temperature of 39.8, and you note her skin to have certain lesions depicted below. What is the diagnosis? So this is enteric fever. What are the lesions shown in the image? So these are rose spots. What is the main causative agent? Salmonella typhi. List four investigations you would undertake to confirm your diagnosis, a blood culture, urine culture, stool culture, FPC and DC. You can also do an ESR. What is the drug of choice in management of this patient? So third generation cephalosporins in resistant areas. Otherwise, we're going to be using fluoroquinolones. I really hope you enjoyed learning about enteric fever or typhoid fever. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. See you in the next video to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye. Thank you.